And we actually have Dr. Lan Zhao, who will be uh, helping answer questions during this panel discussion. So audience, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A chat pod, and we're going to go ahead and get started and try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is for Dr. Yi Zhang. Can bibliographic information be used to justify, to justify classification, solubility, and or permeability of an AP? Uh, the short answer to the first one about the solubility, uh, the answer is no. You should always conduct your own solubility study to establish the high solubility of the drug substance and submit it as a pivotal uh, data to support your waiver request based on BCS class 3. Um, but however, uh, for permeability, uh, you may refer to uh, either uh, NDA information or any uh, public available uh, information on the permeability of uh, the particular uh, drug substances you are requesting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We have another question for you. Can the agency publish a list of BCS Class three drug products, IR dosage? Um, basically, uh, um, if you um, uh, uh, listen to my presentation earlier, I have briefly summarized all the efforts that agency has taken and they initiated multiple grants and contract and the internal research project on BCS3 uh, based the waiver. Uh, so uh, we, uh, a short answer to this question. Uh, does the agency uh, has the intention, uh, you know, to publish a list of uh, drug products um, which are classified as BCS3 at this moment? No. However, I just want to um, uh, let you know we have been trying very hard uh, and collaborated with um, both industry and academia. And uh, once we have, uh, you know, sufficient uh, information to support waiver request, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, and uh, the BCS class 3 waiver option, uh, we will uh, add to the corresponding PSG for that particular product. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our next question will be for Dr. Wu. Um, could you please elaborate on how actual bioequivalent simulations can be used? Thanks for this question. And the virtual BE simulation um, is a very useful. And if it's in combination with validated PVPK absorption modeling, it can be used for setting the solution specification, risk assessment of the change of critical quality attributes, Etc. And there's also a potential of using PVDK and the virtual BE simulation as an alternative B approach for supporting the ways of in vivo study, as we mentioned today. So when conducting virtual BE, you may want to use the intended study design in the BE study and also incorporate appropriate variability on the parameters. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We have another question for you. Was bio-relevant media used for dissolution studies for OP in both adult and children ch child population? Uh, you see dissolution data for OP for both adults and children for this case. However, this is a case by case and also purpose dependent. You're welcome to use clinically relevant dissolution uh, data for serving your modeling purpose. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Gong. Does FDA have a preference about the statistical method used for dissolution profile comparison? 
Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I, I would recommend following the dissolution guidances as cited in my presentation slides for the method that's most appropriate for your dissolution data. And um, as far as I'm aware, for highly variable dissolution data, um, bootstrapping F2 is routinely used by the Office of Bioequivalence in OGD. And other approaches are also acceptable with sufficient justification. And uh, currently, so, so to summarize, currently there is no strong preference over the statistical approach. Uh, as long as the um, uh, dissolution data are justified, and however, uh, the expectation is that the approaches and the conclusions are clearly documented in the submission. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Gong. And if you can um, maybe increase your volume, we'll give you a minute to increase your volume on the microphone, and that way we'll and then we'll come back to you. And in the meantime, we have a question for Dr. Zhang. Can literature data or alternative scientific justification of solubility be used as pivotal data to qualify a drug substance for a BCS3 based? Uh, as I just uh, responded earlier, it's a similar uh, question. So basically, solubility uh, data the firm has to conduct uh, themselves and to demonstrate the high solubility for the drug substance. Um, and uh, however, I mean, um, the, the firm always can submit uh, literature as a supportive, but it can be served as a pivotal. So the solubility data sh uh, as serve as the pivotal have to be uh, conducted uh, by the firm uh, itself. Thank you. Great. We have another question for you. Can a BCS3 based bio waiver for one strength be extended to other strengths in its product line? Yeah. Um, the answer is no. Uh, BCS3 uh, based bio waiver for one strength cannot be extended to the other strengths in its uh, product line. Uh, as um, so. Therefore, a BCS-based uh, bulk waiver criteria should be uh, demonstrated for each strength of its uh, product line, as the formulation similarity and uh, in a comparable in vitro dissolution uh, for each strength of the test product uh, when it compared to the corresponding reference product it will like uh, ensure uh, that no uh, potential shift uh, occur. So uh, in another word, each of your strengths have to be, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, meeting all the BCS three based about labor requests. Um, high, highly soluble. I mean, highly soluble basically is uh, almost uh, is always demonstrated for the highest the single dose. However, for uh, dissolution and uh, formulation similarity. It have to be um, compared to the corresponding strengths of the reference product. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And we're going to back to Dr. Gong. In case of MSD method, is it advised to use more than twelve units for comparison? Uh, yeah, uh, the answer is simple. It's uh, not particularly. Okay, great. And we have another question for you. You talked. You only talked about model independent methods in your presentation. When should the applicant apply model dependent? Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, indeed, uh, as I point out at the beginning of my talk, the focus of the talk is model independent methods, and um, uh, model independent methods I uh, think can be useful when. Uh, the profiles for reference and test products do not have the same data, uh, same time points, and um, they can also be uh, useful when there is missing data. But based on our review experience, we rarely seen such scenarios in the end of submissions. And I like to point out uh, some limitations of the model independent approaches. That, that's probably why they are less commonly applied. Uh, in a submission that we've seen. 
is um, first the, the choice of the most appropriate model when using the model dependent approach is really product dependent and might not be unique. And another is on if the numbers of available time points is low, there are possible numerical problems coming with the calculation. Thank you. Great, thank you. We have another question for you. What actions or strategies should companies consider if results from bootstrapping F2 or other statistical approaches do not meet the acceptance criteria? Uh, perhaps then uh, the, the dissolution profiles are dissimilar. Or um, before uh, drawing that conclusion, I would recommend uh, do more thorough assessment. Um, it's, it's a little bit beyond my talk today, which is focused on the statistical approach, but it is uh, crucial that the totality of the data needs to be evaluated to make sure a robust conclusion is drawn for the dissolution profile similarity. So um, bootstrapping F2 or F2 are not only part of the, are, are, they are only part of the total information. And this should be based on data generated by appropriate dissolution methods. And for that reliable calculation of F2, the dissolution method should be discriminating and meaningful. And um, if, uh, the applicant find their data is highly variable. Uh, first, investigate the root cause of the high variability. And the variability in the data should be reduced uh, without compromising on the discriminating uh, ability of the dissolution testing method. And if it is confirmed that the source of variability is due to the drug product, um, alternative statistical analysis may be considerable if the firms um, provide sufficient uh, scientific rationale for their choice of method. And some of the option, uh, including uh, they, they, some of the options include conducting the virtual BE simulations, for example, using PBPK modeling, like Dr. Fang Wu showcased earlier in her presentation to establish the uh, bioequivalence dissolution safe space and evaluate whether the dissolution profiles fall within that safe space boundary. Thank you. Great, thank you. We have a question for Dr. Zeng. What is the definition of very rapidly dissolved? So for BCS3 uh, drug substances, um, they have to meet the very rapidly dissolving. Uh, the spec is not less than 85% in 15 minutes. And um, uh, it has uh, clearly delineated in the uh, uh, BCS guidance as well. Thank you. OK, great. And we have a question for Dr. Wu. What is strategy or any suggestions on the validation of oral PBPK model? Um, so the validation of the PBPK model is very important. And before the application of the established PBPK model, uh, the model should be validated. Uh, the pre predictive performance of a PBPK model should be validated for its intended purpose. Independent data sets which are not used in model development are recommended to evaluate the predictive performance of the model. You may use data set from ROD, the reference product, or from literature to validate your model. Thank you. Great. And another question for you. What is the strategy of optimization of parameters when building PVPK? So uh, when developing your PDPK model uh, for the parameters that you already have experiment data, you may first use those uh, experiment data. When model refinement uh, is necessary, you may use the middle out approach, uh, like use available, eventual, and available data sets to optimize the parameters. Uh, we recommend that you conduct a parameter sensitivity analysis on the parameter uh, to be refined 
And when a model parameter is optimized, you will need to provide uh, the authentic justification, rationale, and also the uh, selected the initial value and the range of the parameters for the uh, sensitivity analysis. And you also need to uh, provide the in vitro and in vivo data used for optimization for the agency to evaluate. Thank you. Great, thank you. Another question. So, can you share your thoughts on what is the biggest data gap keeping from further expansion of oral absorption models? Uh, thanks for the question. I understand the data challenge for a generic drug, and we uh, may use data from literature and data from NDA submissions for model development and validation. And we, can, uh, we also encourage in research projects to fill the knowledge gap. As you have known that um, Gudufa funded research on the uh, opportunities uh, for submitting the proposal and uh, get uh, funded from the agency. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Gong. What are the differences between bootstrapping F2 and MSD? Thank you for that question. Um, besides the differences of calculation steps described in the presentation for bootstrapping F2 and MSD, uh, which the, uh, uh, the slides will be available on the SBI website, um, to summarize from a higher level is uh, different from the uh, MSD method bootstrapping F2, um, as well as F2 method, are based on a non-standardized distance measure. So this means that the absolute difference at the various time points are not weighted by their uh, respective variance for their differing uh, information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gong. Our next question will be for Dr. Zhang. The FDA guidance for biowaivers based on BCS dates, BCS-based biowaivers may be applicable for pharmaceutical alternatives, including other oral dosage forms, for example, powders, if appropriately justified. Based on that, is it acceptable for a comparison of a capsule versus a tablet? And if yes, so Q1 and Q2 requirements are not necessary. Uh, so, quick answer to this question is no, <laughs> um, because uh, as we are uh, well aware, tablets are, are cap and the capsules, so they are not considered to be the same dosage form. So, uh, in principle, uh, I don't think um, they are eligible for BCS uh, three based waiver, um, and uh, because of the differences in the formulation of the same drug substance may potentially influence its uh, corresponding in vivo performance. Uh, if uh, we can recall from my presentation, one of the um, very important criteria for be, uh, being qualified or eligible for BCS class 3 waiver is the formulation similarity. So uh, that means some of the exhibients might uh, uh, impact the absorption of the API. So even though that API is uh, you know, classified as um, so the cross um, between different dosage forms um, can be um, eligible for BCS waiver. I think in this case, uh, I would recommend 505B2 pathway probably should be the most appropriate one. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for all answering all of these questions and taking time out of your schedules to share this information with our audience. I think, um, it's a very um, lot of questions uh, for this topic, so thank you. And with that, that's all the questions we have time for, but we're going to go ahead and go to break.